Good Kathleen Drew, Chair of the Energy Facility Site Evaluation Council, calling this meeting to order. Ms. Grantham, will you call the roll? Certainly. Department of Commerce. Department of Ecology. Eli Levitt, present. Department of Fish and Wildlife. Mike Livingston, present. Department of Natural Resources. Lena Young, present. Utilities and Transportation Commission. Stacy Brewster, present. Local Government and Optional State Agencies for the Horse Heaven Project, Department of Agriculture. Derek Sanderson, present. Benton County, Ed Brost. I do see Mr. Brost is present. Um, for the Badger Mountain Project for Douglas County, Jordan Julio. For the Watoma Solar Project for Benton County, Dave Sharp. Dave Sharp, present. Washington State Department of Transportation, Paul Gonseth. For the Hop Hill Solar Project for Benton County, Paul Crouppen. Paul Crouppen, present. For Character Solar, um, Clickitat County, Matt Childs. Matt Childs, present. Assistant Attorney Generals, John Thompson. John Thompson, present. Janice Locum. Janice Locum, present. And I remember we do have a new Assistant Attorney General. Uh, John Thompson, can you please remind me of his name? I missed his name on the roll call sheet. It is Zach Packer. And is Zach present? Administrative Law Judges, Adam Torum. This is Judge Torum, I'm present. Laura Bradley. Dan Gerard. Joni Derryfield. For council staff, Sonia Bumpus. Sonia Bumpus present. Amy Hofkemeyer. Amy Hofkemeyer present. Amy Moon. Stu Henderson. Joan Owens is present. Dave Walker. Sonia Scavland. Sonia Scavland present. Lisa Massengale. Present. Sarah Randolph. Sean Green. Sarah Reinevelt present. Uh, was that Miss Reinevelt? That's correct. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, you you said present a little early, but I'll mark you down for Council for the Environment. Um, Sean Green for Council staff. Sean Green present. Lance Caputo. Lance Caputo present. John Barnes. Present. Osta Davis. Present. Joanne Snarsky. Joanne Snarsky present. Alex Shiley. Ali Smith. Ali Smith present. Carl Halapa. Halapa present. And for our operational updates, um, Kudatas Valley Wind Project. Eric Malbartis present. Wild Horse Wind Power Project. Jennifer Galbraith present. Grays Harbor Energy Center. Bruce Sharon present. Shahalis Generation Facility. Jeremy Smith present. Columbia Generating Station. Columbia Solar. Thomas Cushing, present. Goose Prairie Solar. Scott Wilson, present. Uh, Chair, there is a quorum for the regular council and all of the other councils. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now taking up the uh, proposed agenda in front of you. Council members? There's an echo. I think we're okay now. Um, so the proposed 
<laughs> agenda is in front of you. Is there a motion to adopt the pro proposed agenda? Lenny Young, so moved. Eli Levitt, second. Thank you. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is adopted. Moving on to the meeting minutes from September 20th, 2023. Uh, is there a motion to approve the meeting minutes? Stacy Brewster, motion to approve the September 20th, 2023 meeting minutes. Second. Mike Livingston, second. Thanks. I have no corrections. Is, does anyone else have any edits or corrections? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is adopted. Moving on to our, pro, our operational updates, Skittitas Valley Wind Project. Mr. Milbardis. Uh, Mr. Malbardis, you are muted if you're trying to speak. Just a heads up. I see that you're still in here, so hopefully. Sorry about that. Uh, new new headset. Um, no worries. This is Eric, Mel Eric Malbardis with EDP Renewables for the Kittitas Valley Wind Power Project. And we had nothing non-routine to report for the period. Thank you. Moving on to the Wild Horse Wind Power Project, Ms. Galbraith. Yes, thank you, Chair Drew, Council members and staff. This is Jennifer Galbraith representing Puget Sound Energy for the Wild Horse Wind Facility. For the month of September, I have no non-routine updates. Thank you. Um, for Grace Harbor Energy Center, Mr. Sharon. Afternoon, Chair Drew, Council members and staff. This is Chris Sharon, a plant manager from Grace Harbor Energy Center. For the month of September, we have no non-routine items to report. We did submit our RADA results to FSEC staff, Norca. Thank you. And apparently I took you out of order, so I will go back to um, Chehalis Generation Facility, Mr. Smith. Good afternoon, Chair Drew, FSEC Council and staff. Uh, this is Jeremy Smith, maintenance manager representing Chehalis Generation Facility. I have one non-routine item to report, and uh, it's Stefano Schnitger has assumed the plant manager position effective September 6th. Are there any Great. questions? No, thank you. Thank you for that update. And moving on to the Columbia Solar Project, Mr. Cushing. Good oh, hold on one second. There's some background noise. Good afternoon, Chair Drew, Council members and staff. This is Thomas Cushing, Asset Manager for the Columbia Solar Projects. For the month of September, we have no non-routine updates. Thank you. For the Columbia Generating Station and WNP 1 and 4, Felicia Nahara Paxton. Hi, good, good afternoon, Chairman Drew. Thanks for uh, letting me uh, join kind of late. I apologize for that. Um, for this month, um, Columbia Generating Station has no non-routine um, items to report. We did have Washington State Fire Marshal conduct inspection of the IDC and CGS buildings on October uh, 2nd through the 4th with no major findings communicating following the inspection. Thank you. Thank you. For Goose Prairie Solar, Mr. Wilson. Uh, yeah, there is uh, no non routine updates uh, to report uh, as far as construction report our, our project is on schedule uh, all our <clears throat> excuse me all our lay down yards have been completed uh, the substation grading uh, and foundations are complete uh, control house was delivered and set to site we just did get uh, one of our main power transformers today and got that set the second one is scheduled to come early November uh, all our roads are in interior and exterior roads um, the PVRA mainline roads, like I said, are complete. The feeders are complete. PV panels are starting to arrive. We've got some panels starting to uh, show up tomorrow. As far as SWIP, uh, it's being modified. 
Uh, we're going to try to submit it to FSEC within the next few weeks. Uh, we do, do have foot monitoring um, through WSB there here weekly. Uh, they have found nothing really to report. Uh, as far as uh, public outreach, we are, uh, us, us and PCL are, are getting together. Uh, we're going to donate some AEDs to the Moxley Police Department. Uh, it's going to be uh, November 1st. We're going to have a little, little get together with them and present the AEDs. And that uh, just quick down and dirty for Bruce Perry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Moving on to the high top and I top in the Austria project. Ms. Hofkemeyer. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Drew and Council. For the High Top and Ostria project, staff continue to work with the developer on pre-construction requirements and plans. Uh, we have no other updates at this time. Thank you. Uh, for Whistling Ridge, Mr. Caputo, project update. Thank you, Chair Drew and Council members. The applicants for the Whistling Ridge Energy Project submitted an extension request as well as a petition to amend their site certification agreement. Staff are looking at available dates to schedule the meetings for the council. May I answer any questions? Are there any questions? Thank you for the update. Desert claim, Ms. Hofkemeyer. Thank you. Uh, again, for the record, this is Amy Hofkemeyer providing a project update on Desert Claim. At the last council meeting on September 20th, staff updated the council on the proposed amendment to the Desert Claim Site Certification Agreement, or SCA, in which the certificate holder EDF Renewables submitted a request to amend the Desert Claim SCA. EDF Renewables requested an extension of the substantial completion date from November 13th, 2023 to November 13th, 2028. As presented last month, the State Environmental Policy Act or SEPA review was limited to the changes proposed by the amendment request. Staff recommended provisions for inclusion in the SCA amendment to account for current conditions in the project area, industry, or agency practices that have evolved since the initial certification and information that has become available since the desert claim SCA was last amended in 2018. Um, at the previous meeting, I outlined the conditions that staff recommended to include in an SCA amendment, including limiting the build window by capping, capping any further SCA extension requests. Any further extension requests would not be allowed unless construction is reasonably underway, but may not reach the definition of substantial completion, including a requirement for the aircraft detection lighting system, if approved by the Federal Aviation Administration, to be reviewed for any appropriate additional permit requirements including a commitment in the desert claim waste management plan to recycle project components when possible and requiring the certificate holder to consider the feasibility during micrositing to place all turbines more than 0.5 miles from non-participating residences to avoid dominating views from these sensitive viewing locations. One additional recommendation was made during the September 20th council meeting associated with extending the wildlife monitoring for carcasses However, after additional evaluation by FSEC staff, this was determined to already be included in the SCA. Therefore, this recommendation has not been incorporated into the resolution that you have in front of you for consideration. At the September 20th Council meeting, Council directed staff to discuss these recommendations with the developer and prepare a resolution for Council consideration. Staff met with EDF Renewables to confirm concurrence on these provisions. The draft was provided to council review and made available for public comment. Staff received one public comment speaking against the viability of the project, but that did not result in any suggested changes to the draft resolution. If the council approves the resolution as drafted, staff will prepare an amended SCA to reflect these changes for review and approval at the November council meeting. At this time, staff recommend council deliberate and a vote to approve the draft resolution. Are there any questions? Are there any questions for Ms. Hofgemeier? Okay, you all have and have received the draft resolution in front of you. Is there a motion to approve the draft resolution as presented 
approving the request for amendment for desert claim wind power project. Lenny, uh, I, I move the resolution as amended. May I ask a few questions? Oh, sure. Absolutely. I'm sorry. One is just a details nuance. You said half a mile from any residence, but the letter says 2,500 feet. So that's a little bit different. Chair, point, point of order. Do we need to uh, have the resolution, the, dra the matter that's in front of us, seconded before we begin discussion? Sure. We can have a second. Stacy Brewster, second. Thank you. OK, please continue, Mr. Levitt. Ms. Hofkemeyer. Um, so the proposed resolution. I'm sorry, I'm not saying the 2,500 feet. I believe the 2,500 feet was part of the um, amendment in 2018 and staff are proposing that it be um, increased to half a mile, um, which is a little bit more than 2,500 feet. I think it's approximately 26 or 2,700 feet. Yes. Um, the feasibility of that be reviewed. If, if there's a typo in the draft resolution, certainly we can amend that. The 2,500 feet is listed on page one, so maybe page it one. is talking about the old agreement bottom of page one yes yes that would be the background there and so the resolution then if you look to well the yes it's all the resolution but let's uh double check and then while we're checking that, I have a question about the the one public comment seemed to indicate that the uh, population in the area has changed. Maybe new housing, new residents. To what degree has the applicant and or FSAC been able to reach out to people about the ongoing history of this project? Uh, staff have not conducted um, outreach outside of noticing for these activities. Um, I would have to check with the applicant about any additional activities. Um, one of the topics of discussion amongst staff and the developer was that in the 2018 amendment, um, the primary visual concern was shadow flicker. Um, and so that was the, the consideration for the setback for the 2018 amendment. Um, and so the the recommendation to include or to increase that to half a mile um, would be for not only shadow flicker, but visual dominance. Um, and so at least internally, that discussion has evolved somewhat, um, but we have not had direct input from nearby residents. We also noticed um, the existing distribution list with updated contacts. So anybody who was previously following the desert claim project should still have received notice for this activity. As well as people within a certain um, geographic distance from the project. Yeah, the, the original list would have included the one mile landowners. One mile landowners, okay. Other questions? Thank you, Chair. Are there Chair? Yes, Chair. Chair this, Chair, this is Lonnie Young. Could staff yes. refresh as to the need for a five-year extension as opposed to a one or two-year extension? What what information is available to the council as to the length of the extension? It's staff's understanding that a five-year extension would allow the developer to enter into. Um, offtake agreements and uh, power, I think power purchase agreements, um, as well as to begin construction. Um, so this extension would also include the initiation of construction, not just the the power purchase agreements and offtake agreements. It, is it staff's assessment that that's a reasonable request, a reasonable amount of time? 
It is. We are um, aware that they are actively participating in requests for proposals uh, to find um, buyers for this project. And it is our understanding that those are, are sort of an ongoing process um, and that there are multiple RFPs and opportunities uh, coming up in the, the coming years. Thank you. Any other questions, Ms. Brewster? Yeah, um, regarding the feasibility study of placing the turbines outside of a half mile, um, what's the case if they present that that is not feasible? Is there any requirements for a distance that we can impose? Uh, I think that we could impose um, the requirement for half a mile um, in because at this point it's it's a flexibility of I think approximately 200 feet. Um, when we met with e EDF Renewables, they did request um, to to maintain some of that flexibility uh, for engineering purposes. Um, also, I believe that if it is less than that, the certificate holder would submit for the council's review prior to micro micrositing and analysis of the feasibility. So we would have that come to us before the final decision is, as is uh, written in this resolution. Thank you. Other questions? Hearing none, there's a motion on the floor to approve the draft resolution as, as presented approving the request for amendment for desert claim. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The resolution is adopted. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the Horse Heaven project. Project update, Ms. Hofgemeyer. Thank you, Chair Drew. Uh, FSEC have received the post adjudication application for site certification from the applicant on September 22, 2023. This updated ASC included a traffic impact analysis, updated surveys and reports, turbine and solar reductions, and updated commitments. The reduction in proposed turbines is to remove 13 turbines from turbine option one for a total of 231 turbines and three turbines from turbine option two for a total of 147 turbines. The solar reduction is to reduce energy generation at the eastern solar array from 300 megawatts to 100 megawatts and a reduction in solar array footprint from 6,570 acres to 5,447 acres. Staff have been very busy incorporating the updated post adjudication ASC, which was required within 30 days after the conclusion of the hearings per Washington Administrative Code 463-60-116. FSEC is currently updating the analysis of impacts for the final environmental impact statement or final EIS and incorporating the traffic impact analysis that was received with the post adjudication ASC update. Final EIS tasks also include incorporating public comments, agency outreach, tribal uh, coordination, and fine-tuning mitigation. Um, before I continue, are there any questions? Any questions from council members? All right. Um, to this afternoon, uh, we have Sean Green available uh, who will be giving a presentation on the final EIS so that uh, council are familiar with the structure and changes as you approach your upcoming review. Uh, staff are anticipating that the final EIS will be issued and available to the council and the public uh, October 31st of this year. Thank you. Mr. Green. Yes. Um, just watching my presentation spin for a minute here. Um, thank you, Chair Drew and, and Council. My, my name is Sean Green. I am the 
SEPA specialist and uh, environmental planner for FSEC. And as Amy mentioned, the purpose of this presentation is to update the Council on changes taken to the Horse 7 EIS since the publication of the draft EIS and brief the Council on what changes that they should look for in their review of the upcoming uh, final EIS that will be published. Uh, the, the target publication date is the end of the month. If you can go to the next slide. Uh, so upon the publication of the draft EIS, we entered into a public comment period. As required by Washington Administrative Code, the, the, the period was 30 days in length plus an additional 15 day extension period per request, so 45 days total. Uh, upon the culmination of that period, that common period, we had public hearings on February 1st of 2023, during which we had 74 speakers. Uh, in combination between written and verbal comments, we had two, approximately 2,500 comments received. 1,217 of those were deemed substantive. Uh, in, the, in this case, non-substantive comments were those that generally expressed uh, support or opposition for the project without specifically uh, suggesting changes or questions or comments that were otherwise irrelevant to the environmental review of the project. All comment responses, substantive or not, will receive a response as part of this process, and revisions are integrated throughout the, the final EAS from those comment responses. Next slide, please. Since the publication of the draft EAS, we've had a series of discussions with other agencies and governments in the process of developing the final EAS, the most prominent of which was the Yakima Nation, who we have begun monthly meetings with uh, between Yakima Nation staff and FSEC staff, following the express desire for a more regular discussion between our staffs from Chairman Lewis of the Yakima Nation. As part of those discussions, the Yakima Nation have shared confidential wildlife and cultural data that has been incorporated into the FEIS. Uh, all references within the publicly available FEIS have been either referenced indirectly or redacted so as to protect the confidentiality of the data, but the unredacted versions will be included with the FEIS under separate cover, cover for the Council during the review. Uh, we also had a series of discussions with Washington State Department of Transportation during our coordination on the development of the traffic impact analysis and the review of the subsequently published analysis that the applicant provided. Next slide, please. There were a series of data collections taken since the draft EIS that have been incorporated into the FEIS, uh, the first of which was the traffic impact analysis, which included project generated trips, peak hour traffic volumes, oversized truck haul routes, and traffic safety analyses. These were developed based on conversations with the county and Washington State Department of Transportation and the process of incorporating that the data collected into the impact assessments within the transportation section of the FEIS is ongoing. Uh, also, there were updated raptor nest surveys that were performed uh, following the 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2022 surveys that were intended to track the status of previously identified nests and identify new nests within the area. And the third primary new source of data was the inclusion of three new key, obs key observation points that came about as a result of public comments received following the draft EIS. These new, and new visual simulations were created for these key, these KOPs, these key observation points, and existing simulations were updated to, to reduce the effect of hazing from atmospheric conditions that were that that hazing was included in the original versions of those simulations. These new KOPs were intended to address impacts to motorists, residents, and cultural resources, depending on the individual KOP. Next slide, please. So these next two slides are referencing project reductions that came about due to applicant commitments following the adjudication process. Uh, this slide specifically is 
in ref reference to data request non response, which was I think more more commonly referred to as the moon memo during the adjudication process for council reference. Uh, a summary of the changes, the reductions specifically, we're reducing the east solar array from approximately 2,000 acres to just over 600 acres for a, about a 1,400 acre reduction. Uh, shifting three turbines from turbine option one away from Weber and Sheep Canyons, removing 13 proposed turbines from turbine option one and three from turbine option two, uh, removing duplicate transmission lines and substation infrastructure, which included the, the uh, conversion of approximately four miles of transmission lines to buried collector lines. Uh, while that and that is a case where it is both a reduction and addition because it is reducing visual impacts, but there is an associated increase in uh, temporary disturbance, which is being incorporated into the FEIS review. And finally, a reduction of the East battery station to 100 megawatts from 150. Uh, there is no associated reduction in footprint associated with this, however. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, these, this slide covers reductions that were proposed by the applicant following that data request nine response in um, this was a specific memo on September 26th and included a, an additional nine proposed turbines to be removed from turbine option one, accounting for 22 total between the two reductions. And this, this specific memo, this nine turbine reduction is referenced within the FEIS, but it is not included in our impact analysis due to time constraints, but it will be available to the council for their consideration when reading through the FEIS and assuming the project is um, approved incorporation into these the site certification agreement. And the, ap the applicant noted that the turbines that were re proposed removal between turbine options one and two were due to concerns noted in public comments and adjudication and were intended to reduce impacts to several different resources. And as an example, that visual at the bottom of this page is a, sim a visual simulation provided by the applicant from a key observation point and the three closest turbines within that green rectangle are three of the 22 that are proposed for removal from the final project design. Next slide, please. And in, in concert with the reductions that the applicant has proposed since the draft EIS, they have proposed a number of additions to the project. Uh, this, uh, all, all additions were included within that data re request nine response in August. The first is the addition of an offsite laydown yard north of the project that covers approximately 23 acres uh, that is outside of the previously surveyed area. Uh, this laydown yard would be specifically used for uh, temporary laydown of turbine blades before installation. And staff is currently developing uh, additional mitigation and, and the necessary uh, data collection for potential use of this laydown yard. In addition, there was the passage of House Bill 1173, which requires all current and future um, wind turbine projects within the state of Washington to request FAA approval for the use of an aircraft detection lighting system. The applicant has gone through the planning process for how to incorporate this into the project and has come to the, the point where they believe five radar sensor towers uh, an example of which it can be seen in the bottom right of this page will be needed to be installed across the project for for the implementation of the system. One of these five towers is outside of the previously surveyed area and altogether they will uh, require approximately 8,000 feet of new roads and 10,000 feet of new electrical infrastructure. Next slide please. And the final project additions that were incorporated into that data request nine response were the the upgrading and extension of the county well road transmission line. Approximately four miles will be upgraded from 230 kilovolts to 500 kilovolts, and just over 1,000 feet of that new line and one new support structure will be located outside of the previously surveyed area. And that visual in the bottom right, the 
the top image is the existing conditions at that key, key observation point, and the bottom is the original visual simulation. The towers in the blue rectangle as part of this upgrade will be more akin in size to the existing towers in the yellow rectangle, so they will be taller. Um, and the final addition was that the West battery station will be upgraded from 150 megawatts to 200 megawatts, which will increase the, the footprint of that from six acres to 10 acres. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this image and a, a similar one for Turbine Option 2 will be provided to the Council with the FEIS. This is a visual representation of the reductions, or rather the project changes that the, the applicant has proposed. Uh, and just a few areas to note, the green highlighted area in the bottom right indi is indicative of the reduction of that's, that east solar field. The the green dots along the northern edge of the project are the turbines that are proposed for removal. They are primarily associated with the ridge line. And the green lines on the western part are the transmission lines that have been that are no longer proposed as part of the project, whereas the blue one, blue line is the newly proposed uh, transmission line. And next slide, please. As for the Structure of the FEIS, it is similar to the draft EIS with the executive summary coming first, chapter one indicating project background, which includes a SEPA review history and defines the purpose of need both the project for the applicant and the EIS for FSEC. Uh, chapter two, which will cover the proposed action alternatives, which encompasses the project description and alternatives that were assessed as part of the EIS, including the no action alternative. Chapter three is the affected environment, uh, which covers pre-project conditions for the 14 SEPA environmental resources and socioeconomics, and also represents the uh, the no the anticipated results of the no in, no action alternative. Chapter four is impacts and mitigation measures, direct and in, indirect, from project actions. Uh, applicant proposed avoidance and impact reduction commitments are included in this section, as well as FSEC staff recommended mitigation. And this section also includes the impact ratings for all, uh, all 15 resources that were assessed. Uh, cumulative impacts, Chapter 5, will cover impacts combined from the project alone, combined with other past, present, or reasonably foreseeable developments. And Chapter 10, which is new for this final EIS, is the summary of public comments received and responses on the draft EIS and will include consolidated responses to public comments received. Next slide, please. Now I won't go through all of these, but this is a representative example of some of the changes that are in Chapter 3 of the final EIS as a result of public comments and are different from the draft EIS. A few to note, However, are that we have included viticultural areas in the wine industry as an affected resource under land use due to public comments. Uh, and as I noted before in visual, the addition of three key observation points with accompanying visual simulations. Uh, these were intended to address previously underrepresented or unrepresented viewshed concerns raised during the public comment period. And finally, for transportation, we have the removal of State Route 221 from consideration as an oversize and overweight load route as the applicant supplied transportation impact assessment indicated that it was not intended to be used for such purpose. Uh, should that change in the future, we would require additional data collection or and potentially mitigation. Next slide, please. And again, I won't read through all of these. Uh, this is not intended to be a comprehensive list of all the changes within Chapter 4. There are substantial rewrites throughout, but a few that are more pressing based on the degree of change or the relevancy to the number of public comments received. Under air, we included an air dispersion modeling analysis that was added for several emissions, uh, which also includes the newly proposed use of an on-site concrete batch plant during construction at, as at the applicant's request. Under vegetation, we added a new uh, mitigation measure, vegetation nine, that requires that the applicant regularly 
regularly clear project fencing of any vegetative growth with the goal of both reducing the visual impact of the fencing and the risk of fire due to the fuel load that the vegetation that the vegetation could represent. Under wildlife, uh, species five mitigation has been expanded. Uh, this specifically targets impacts to Ferrugian stock, the, the Ferrugian stock, and will would disallow construction of project components within two miles of documented Ferrugian stock nests, except in cases where the applicant is able to demonstrate that the nest site and foraging habitat is no longer available and that the compensatory habitat would provide a net gain in Ferrugian stock habitat. For this mitigation, habitat deemed no longer available would include habitat that has been altered by landscape scale development to the extent that the territory is no longer viable for that species. And the pre-construction technical advisory group and FSEC are required to approve and concur with that determination uh, of non-viability and would be required that, that would be required for any encroachment on this two mile buffer and additional mitigation would be developed as necessary if there is uh, an encroachment on uh, an, a historic nest that is no longer viable. And for historic and cultural, there is one case of the reduction of a determination of significance uh, for pre-contact ar archaeological isolates in the draft EIS, they were determined to be the, the impact was determined to be significant even after the imposition of applicant commitments and FSEC mitigation. Uh, we have reduced that to a determination of non-significance based on the fact that the cultural resource avoidance plan would ensure that the two identified pre-contact isolates found on site would not be impacted or affected by project actions. And finally, visual, we have the removal of the visual for mitigation that was proposed in the draft EIS, which would have requ required color treating solar collectors and support structures. Based on our review, we, we believe that that, te that technology is not practical at this moment. And we have included revisions to the visual fives uh, mitigation, which requires the installation of color treated opaque fencing within half a mile of KOPs or residences and believe that to be sufficient to address the visual concerns associated with the, the solar arrays. Next slide, please. So for the purpose of SEPA and this, this EIS, uh, we define significant as having a reasonable likelihood of more than a moderate adverse impact on environmental quality or having a severe adverse impact on environmental quality, even if the chance is not considered great. And for the EIS, significance is determined after the assumed application of all relevant applicant commitments and FSEC staff recommended mitigation being imposed as part of the site certification agreement. After all of after this analysis and the imposition of those commitments and mitigation, we have determined that there are three SEPA environmental resources with identified significant impacts, those being visual aesthetics, recreation, and historic and cultural. Next slide, please. For a visual, this uh, significant impact is associated with the operation phase specifically for the comprehensive project uh, due, to the, due to the component of the wind turbines. We have identified several visual mitigation outlined there that we believe will reduce this impact, uh, and especially in concert with the, the turbine reductions that are proposed by the applicant since the draft EIS. But as, as can be seen in, in more detail within our chapter four review of this resource, we believe that post mitigation and applicant commitments, the turbines would still dominate views from many key observation points and the landscape will appear strongly altered. So we have recommended a, a finding of significant unavoidable adverse impacts for this resource. Next slide, please. For recreation, we have identified significant unavoidable adverse impacts for the operation phase of the project on paragliding and hang gliding safety. The area around the project is used for these activities, even though it is not an offici officially designated use by any state agency. 
Uh, we have identified several different mitigation measures that we will recommend as to be incorporated within the STA as, as outlined there, primarily focused on coordinating with recreation groups and performing outreach on a safety management plan. But we believe that the turbines and solar arrays would still limit recreation availability for paragliding and hang gliding throughout the project area and present a safety risk for those activities. Next slide, please. And the third resource where we believe that there are significant unavoidable adverse impacts is for historic and cultural, specifically for traditional cultural properties during the construction, operation, and decommissioning phases of the project. We have recommended mitigation in the form of ongoing engagement with affected tribes in an attempt to identify mitigation measures that they believe would be effective in reducing any the, the, the anticipated impacts. But we believe that they will. There, there is insufficient mitigation that we have been able to identify to reduce these impacts to a level of non significance. And we believe that there will be significant impacts to traditional cultural properties due to ground disturbance, physical alteration, loss of access, and visual interference. And for this resource in particular, the Aquaman Nation has provided a map of project components that show which components will be impacted by TCPs and identifies the number of TCPs that will be impacted by each turbine. Uh, this map will not be included within the publicly available EIS due to confidentiality concerns, but will be provided to the Council for the review packet. Uh, next slide, please. And to reiterate what, what Amy said at the start, we anticipate that the EIS will be issued by the end of October and be, and be available to the Council at that point. We will be giving a second presentation at the November 29th council meeting that will more specifically address council actions and uh, the next steps in the FSEC process to follow uh, council review of the EIS. And council members are uh, uh, encouraged to ask any questions that they have either now or at the November meeting once they've had time to look at the EIS and FSEC staff will be available to answer any questions that they arrive at during the review of the EAS once it is available to them outside of council scheduled meetings. Um, one final note is that the the November 29th meeting will include a several subject matter expert guests from other agencies uh, as uh, to be available for council questions, and they have requested that if council members identify questions that they have for those subject matter experts prior to that November 29th meeting, they would appreciate uh, SX staff being available to, or being able to transmit to them those questions to them so that they can more comprehensively answer answer those questions. But at this point, I'm available to answer any questions that you have based on this presentation. Thank you very much for a very comprehensive uh, presentation. When you speak about the November 29th meeting, that is a special meeting, is that not right? And not our usual November meeting, Ms. Hofkemeyer? That is correct. Uh, uh, staff will be noticing a special meeting on November 29th, specifically for the purposes of answering council questions on their review of the final EIS and having these subject matter experts available. Um, as Sean mentioned, uh, we we have identified some subject matter experts uh, that are already scheduled to be there. Um, but if council identify questions in their review and they have specific subject matter experts that they would like to um, get some more information from or ask questions of, um, that would be helpful for us to to include those people. Um, and if I can just go over one more time what our next steps are, maybe Ms. Bumpus can work with me on this so that we make it clear for the public and for the council members that we have deliberation on the adjudication and that will result in an order of findings and conclusions on the information we gathered through the adjudicative process. In the SEPA process, we have the um, the conclusion of the final environmental impact statement, which goes through you, Ms. Bumpus, as the SEPA responsible official. What we do with this information as a council is we take the information from this as well as the adjudication 
to form our recommendation to the governor. Is that true? That's correct. As the council yeah. does, have questions about that or is that uh, clear? Okay. Um, are there questions from council members at this point in time? I know there's a lot to chew on, so. I would also say that you can also reach out to FSEC staff, Ms. Bumpus, Ms. Hofkemeyer, Mr. Green, primarily on um, the FEIS if you have questions you'd like to ask them to clarify. Uh, Ms. Moon is also very knowledgeable, knowledgeable about the project and is available for questions, just not this week. <laughs> okay, she does deserve a minute or two off. Um, sure, go ahead, Mr. Levitt. Yeah, I guess I just want to ask one question based on the presentation. Um, it says ongoing engagement with affected tribes to identify appropriate mitigation measures that could include the demarcation of culturally sensitive areas to be avoided. That one's just interesting to me because it seems like we've heard from people that uh, tribes would prefer that culturally sensitive areas not be easily identified. So if you demarcate them, then other people can know where they are. Yeah, that that's absolutely a good point. Uh, that is why no geographic geographical data that we have available for traditional cultural properties is being shared within the publicly available EIS. That mitigation measure is intended to ensure that FSEC, the applicant and affected tribes continue coordination uh, throughout the life of the project and, and prior to construction. If the identification of no-go zones is something that the tribes are interested in and which, as you point out, would necessarily involve the, the, the the disclosure of the location of those those cultural resources. That is something that we want to be available for discussion. Um, I don't know if it is practicable, but we are retaining it there as an option. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Chair, Chair Drew, this is uh, Lenny Young. Uh, if I may, uh, Sean, I've got three questions for you. Uh, one that pertains to the post adjudication changes to the ASC and then two that per pertain to the final EIS. Uh, as to the first, were there any post adjudications to the ASC that expressly addressed traditional cultural property concerns raised by the Yakima Nation? There was nothing specifically that addressed those concerns. I would note that the reductions that were proposed in the project layout one of the resources that was discussed as potentially benefiting from those reductions was cultural and historic resources uh at, to this point i i don't believe that the applicant has been uh, made made aware of the exact geographical location of tcps of concern okay and so was there any specific correlation between any of the post adjudication changes and areas in which uh, concern about TCPs have been expressed? I, I can say that TCP concerns cover the uh, almost the entirety of the project area. Uh, right. So I, I don't want to give out any geographical information, but any reduction that was proposed by the applicant would to some degree or another benefit uh, or reduce TCP index. Okay, thanks. And then in, uh, I'm gonna defer to uh, Shauna Volkers and then I'll, I'll return with my next two questions. We're taking questions only from council members. Okay, then, then I'll proceed. Uh, the next two questions I have are more related to the FEIS. Uh, in the cumulative impacts assessment, uh, one of the lines of testimony that the council heard during the adjudicative proceedings was around uh, landscape level impacts to the way that air flows, uh, velocities and airflow patterns. Was any of this taken into account in the final EIS as in the terms of cumulative impacts and how development of one particular area could impact the quality and the availability of air and wind? in other parts of, of the landscape? 
I don't know that it has at this point. I know that we are still developing uh, chapter five, which is a cumulative impacts chapter. So we can look at incorporating that if it is not already in. Great, thank you. And then my, my last question is, in terms of the, the new uh, aspect of the analysis around impacts to the wine industry, uh, I wanted to see whether impacts to the wine industry in terms of the growing and the production and manufacturing of wine, were those distinguished from impacts to the wine tourism industry? Because it strikes me that perhaps uh, impacts might be slightly different between or somewhat different between those two, two uh, specific areas, wine, wine production versus wine tourism. Yeah, you're, you are correct. The agricultural lands that are targeted for this project do not, to my knowledge, include any active vineyards. The new analysis that was included within the FBIS was really more focused on the ecotourism industry and the uh, and the socioeconomic impacts associated with that. Great. I, I think that might be significant in terms of whether whether we consider it more in the realm of socioeconomic impacts versus impacts to the practice of agriculture. Th and thank you for your responses. I'm, I'm done. Are there additional questions from council members? Yeah, Chair Drew, this is Mike Livingston. Go ahead. I have a question for Sean Green. Um, with the two-mile mile buffer that's being um, instituted around Ferruginous Hawk Nest, do you do you have a number for me as to how many um, would be a, that would be applied to? How many turbines? I is that your question, Mr. Livingston? No. No. How many? The, how many? How many nest sites? Oh, okay. Or territories? What I? What is the metric first? I guess that's clarification. Is it territories or is it nest sites? And then how many? Thank you. Sure. So uh, a, a lot of this is outlined in our chapter three and four discussion of wildlife, but we have used uh, historical document historically documented Bruges hawk nests. Uh, as the baseline in, in addition to those nests that were identified during the, at this point, I believe five years of surveys performed by the applicant. Uh, and we have also included uh, his, um, historic nesting habitat and any, any, any location where a nest has been documented at any point is considered, is what we are considering a potentially active Ferruginous hawk nest. So every, Historically documented nests is given that two mile buffer, which then leads to that that discussion of if we can come to a, a, a understanding that the habitat in the area is no longer viable and that nest is no longer present, then there could potentially be project actions within that buffer with additional mitigation. But any any place where we have ever identified a nest is considered as as part of that mitigation. Thank you. Oh, and I'm sorry, I think you asked for a number. I, I don't have the exact number. I think it's around 60, but somewhere around there. And we will have that information um, at the end of the yes. month and then the opportunity to also go into more depth with um, agency experts during the 29th meeting as well. So thank you council members for your very good questions. And at this point in time, we will be moving on to, and thank you, Sean, for your excellent presentation. And we will be moving on then to the Badger Mountain project update, Ms. Snarsky. Yes, thank you, Chair Drew, and good afternoon, council members. For the record, this is Joanne Snarsky, the siding specialist for Badger Mountain Solar. Progress continues to be made on the development of the draft environmental impact statement for the proposed Badger Mountain Solar Project. At the previous council meeting, staff identified that we would be conducting additional cultural resource survey work, and we are working with our consultant, WSP, to prepare for this activity. FSEC and WSP have finalized a contract for the additional survey, and it appears they may be able to complete the work before the snow is on the ground. We anticipate the findings of the survey will be incorporated 
into the draft environmental impact statement. That's it. And do you have any questions? No, but I'm happy to hear that and we'll keep our fingers crossed that we can do that. Thank you, Ms. Narsen. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we are now moving on to the Watoma Solar Project. Mr. Caputo. Thank you, Chair Drew and Council members. The applicants for the Watoma Solar Energy Project uh, recently I'm sorry. Recently submitted the final supplemental cultural resource survey requested by FSEC in the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation. We are presently reviewing the report for compliance in coordination with DAP and the Yakima Nation cultural staff. After we have concurrence from DAP, we will prepare a CEPA threshold determination. May I answer any questions? Are there any questions about the project update? And I do have one more statement. From the, for the extension request. Yes, in your information package, you'll find a request by the applicants for an extension of their application until June 28, 2024. Staff have coordinated with the applicant on this timeline. We did not receive any public comments on the extension. Therefore, staff recommends the council approve the applicant's request. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from council members about the extension request? You see that in front of you and received it um, in the information for the meeting. Um, extension request until No, I'm not finding it. June 28th, 2024. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, first sentence there. So any questions for Mr. Caputo on that or any comments from council members? Okay. Is there a motion to approve the extension request for the Watoma Solar application to June 28th, 2024. Lenny Young, so moved. Thank you. Second. Casey Brewster, second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is adopted. Thank you. We are now moving on to the Hop Hill Solar Project update. Mr. Barnes. Thank you, Chair Drew and Council Members. For the record, this is John Barnes, FSEC staff for the Hop Hill application. Update for September. We are continuing to coordinate and review the application with our contract and contracted agencies and tribal governments. We are anticipating receiving supplemental information in the coming weeks. A land use consistency legal advice memo has been drafted by our assistant attorney general and has been provided for you in the October council packet. At this time, we would like to request the council to direct the staff to prepare an order of inconsistency with which the council would then review and vote on at the November meeting. Are there any questions? Are there any questions for Mr. Barnes? You all did receive um, the legal advice memo and the motion would be to direct the staff to draft an order determining the land use to be inconsistent and setting the matter for adjudication. Are there any questions either for um, Mr. Barnes or for our AAG? Okay, hearing none, is there a motion to direct the staff to draft an order determining land use to be inconsistent and setting the matter for adjudication? Stacey Brewster, so moved. Lenny Young, second. Thanks. Discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries.
Carriger Solar Update, Ms. Snarsky. Hello again. Thank you, Chair Drew and Council members. For the record, this is Joanne Snarsky, the Siting Specialist for Carriger Solar. FSEC staff continue to work with the Car Carriger Solar applicant to address anticipated visual impacts to the proposed project. In accordance with RCW 80.50.090 sub 3 sub A, the applicant is allowed to provide clarification to make changes to the proposal to mitigate the anticipated environmental impacts. We are currently in the process of evaluating the needs for supplemental visual simulations to help us better understand the potential impacts. These new simulations will lead to further potential mitigation discussions and will result in a formal written response to our initial SEPA determination of significance by the applicant. I can answer any questions. Yes, if you could, the visual simulations, are they being conducted by the applicant? Correct. Well, they're they're a consultant, but yes, they're we're, consultant. We're, correct. Yeah. And then we, we reviewed. Doing. Right. And then reviewed by our staff. OK, correct. yes. And our consultants as well. Yes. And thank you just to. Clarify that I heard that correctly. Um, any other questions from council members? OK, thank you for your report. We'll move on to the second quarter cost allocation. Ms. Bumpus. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Drew and Council members. As we do uh, at the beginning of each quarter, I have the second quarter cost allocations to report to the Council. So I'll just go through and read off these percentages. For Kittitas Valley, we have 4%, Wild Horse, 4%, Columbia Generating Station, 20%, Columbia Solar, 4%, WNP1, 2%, Whistling Ridge, 3%, Grays Harbor, 1 and 2, 6%, Chehalis, 6%, Desert Claim, 4%, Goose Prairie Solar, 4%, 47 Wind Farm, 15%, Badger Mountain, 6%, Cypress Creek Renewables, 4%, Watoma, 6%, Hop Hill, 6%, and Carriger, also 6%. Thank and you. that concludes the update on the cost allocation. Thank you. And with that, um, our agenda is concluded. Thank you all for your participation. The meeting is adjourned.